Thanks for coming back to another episode of Pitch It, a fintech conversation amongst founders, investors, and friends. I'm your host, Todd Anderson, Chief Content Officer at Fintech Nexus. And what we do is we take a peek behind the curtain. What motivates someone to start a company? How do investors make the right bet? What do accelerators do during and, and help enabling the process of, of growing your company? How do banks think of founders? Not to mention, we try to have some fun. And, and what you'll see is we'll also do some special episodes. We have some new features coming. So stick with us and you'll get all you'll need to know about the fintech startup landscape. Pitch It is really a, a part of a larger podcast network here at Fintech Nexus. You can go to my colleague Peter, our co-founder and chairman for Fintech One on One. You can subscribe to his feed. Or we have our newest podcast by one of our writers, Isabel Castro, The Fintech Coffee Break. For everything produced by Fintech Nexus, you can check out Fintech Nexus Podcast, which is really our content fire hose. All shows, webinar replays, even in-person event content, not to mention our weekly news show. As always, we hope that you rate the show and write a review. I take try to really take listener feedback seriously and it, as it helps make the show better. You can also follow the podcast and all of our podcasts on the feed of your choice, whether it be Apple, Spotify, wherever you like to listen, or come directly to news.fintechnexus.com. Now, let's get on with the show. Today's pod, I'm joined by Marcos Fernandez, managing partner of Fiat Ventures. Fiat Ventures is an emerging VC focused on supporting and growing the next generation of market leading early stage companies in the fintech space. And you know, I think it's really a fascinating time in fintech. On the one hand, you have a lot of bad news, and a lot of that bad news has to do with layoffs, which are you know, seemingly happening every single day. But on the other hand, you have these great stories of growth and excitement across fintech. Marcos and I delved deep into, you know, kind of where he thinks and where Fiat sees fintech and how it sits today. What early stage founders should think about when it comes to capital and, and when to raise, when to go to investors. The precarious position that crypto is currently in the lack of diversity across the fintech ecosystem and how some of that could change, operator versus investor, the Las Vegas Raiders, and much, much more. A couple of short PSAs before we get to the episode. We're still accepting applications for Pitch It at Fintech Nexus USA. Just check out fintechnexus.com for details. The link to the application site will be in the show notes. Also, if you want to sponsor an episode, Come on as a guest or sponsor one of our many digital or in-person offerings. Please reach out anytime. Todd, T-O-D-D, at fintechnexus.com. And don't forget, Fintech Nexus USA 2023 coming up May 10th and 11th. Now, without further ado, I present to you Marcos Fernandez, Managing Partner of Fiat Ventures. I hope you all enjoy the show. Hey, Marcos, how are you? Welcome to the podcast. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Todd. Pleasure to be on. Yeah, of course. So tell uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Um, and while doing that, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, Fiat Ventures. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a little bit about myself. You know, I, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, where you don't hear the words venture or capital very, very often, <laughs> but was very fortunate to yeah, but, you know, I have a lot of mentors in my personal life and, and, and get to make my way into the venture space. And, you know, long story short, started as a management consulting after undergrad, um, went and got an MBA from UT Austin, where I was very lucky to have a, a classmate of mine who was just starting off in this world of fintech. And this was back in 2014. And, and I went to visit the company she was at, and that was SoFi. And at the time, you know, you know, 40, 50 people in a room trying to figure out student loan refinancing and <laughs> I did everything I could to keep my foot in that door, like like anything else in, in my life. And so I got to launch a bunch of products at SoFi, um, uh, moved over to Ripple on the cross-border payments and crypto space, 
but outside of my day job, I was always, you know, advising and investing in early stage companies. And that's really what led to Fiat Ventures. So uh, Drew and Alex, my two partners, they started a consultancy a few years before I, I joined. Uh, and, and with that, they're asking for contractual rights to invest and getting some of the best access to information and building deep relationships with founders. And so we decided instead of taking those rights to invest and access and taking them to other VCs that could then profit off of, off of the relationships we were building, we we're going to draw a line in the stand and start our own. So we did that just about two years ago. And, you know, fast forward to today, we've been able to back, you know, 25 great teams and founders. We've worked with over a hundred clients on the consulting side and and, and that's really what we do at Fiat Ventures is not just write a check and then step into the, the, the background and send a couple of emails. It's hands-on support for, for teams and founders as former operators and, and, and priding ourselves in being operators to today. So quickly before we get into some of the, the companies that you guys have backed, um, how'd you come to the name Fiat Ventures? Is is it a play with with crypto in some way and, and kind of the, the fiat versus uh you know programmable money? Kind of how'd you how'd you kind of come to the name fiat? Yeah, it's a great question. It's it's really funny that you say that because um when I was at Ripple, fiat was a four-letter word um <laughs> uh, of, of different bet. sorts. Yeah. And so people were like, oh, so you don't invest in Web3 and in, in, in crypto space. And we we're like, no, no, that's not it. Um, so so Drew and Alex actually met at UC Berkeley when they were doing that together. And, um, you know, they, they were able to, to meet Drew played football. Alex was an equipment manager. They say Drew was like, I didn't play. Alex was like, we had a lot of time. So we talked business. And so Fiat Lux is the motto for or the slogan for UC Berkeley. It means let there be light. And so starting their growth Sultan said, let's let's do like a, a little bit of a nod towards UC Berkeley and Fiat growth is let be grow. Uh, and over time, we, we continue to roll out new lines of business under the Fiat umbrella. And um, that that's kind of stuck on ever since. But no, we, we are fans of both the traditional Fiat <laughs> currency and the evolving cryptocurrency space. <laughs> Uh, tell us, um, tell us about some of the companies that you guys have backed, and and typically where, um, you know, where do you guys fall? Early stage, you know, seed, Series A. Kind of tell us a little bit about how you guys invest, and and maybe some of the brands that you've invested in uh, to date. Yeah, absolutely. So, so typically we're investing at the earliest stages to the early stage. Um, uh, what I mean by that is we'll we'll enter at a pre-seed or a seed. Uh, looking at really companies that have some sort of signs of product market fit or or some sort of founder market fit dynamic that we feel comfortable backing them and 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 but we'll also because we work with some later stage companies on the consulting side we will do some co investments in in early growth stage as well so so we've got a pretty wide palette for those that we participate in but primarily early stage is our sweet spot and the reason why is is because we're able to work alongside these teams for six to 12 to 18 months before they get to that financing point. And so we're not just at a data room or talking to a charismatic founder, we get to see the real, real behind the scenes. So our customers actually using this, what is competition doing in the market? What are the founder dynamics? Are they able to recruit and retain good people? And, and so that gives us a little bit of more conviction to invest across a wider array than, than what you'd see. And as far as companies, you know, we've been really fortunate to, to invest both in the core of fintech, so where we get our background. So Copper Banking, we led their Series A, um, the the fastest growing in in, in leading the the team banking space. Uh, uh, Splitero is another one. We recently announced our Series A that we led their home equity investment. So allowing people better alternatives for tapping into their home equity. Um, I, I saw you had uh, Home Home Pace on recently. Uh, that's a team that we've worked with on the consulting side as well. Um, here that provides access to uh, uh, vacation rental property through fractional models, so as little as $100 per share. So really a lot of uh, these companies that we look for are, are companies that are ultimately trying to break down the barriers of, of financial, um, uh, you know, traditional finance using financial technology. So what I mean by that is we're huge proponents that financial technology is a huge driver of financial mobility and inclusion. And so not only do we like to buy back founders who feel that way, but they're building tools that provide that access over time. And so those are some examples of that. And the last thing I'll mention is we also look at the peripheries of fintech. So we talked a bit about crypto, but the intersection of web 2.0 and 3.0 from the fintech mm -hmm. aspect, the, the intersections of healthcare with fintech, 
the intersections of Web3 and future of work and climate tech with FinTech. And um, we're just huge believers that both embedded finance and, and the evolution of the space are going to create a market where everyone under the sun will be a FinTech and have some sort of FinTech component over time. Um, that's a whole different rabbit hole. Those are also <laughs> spaces that we're actively investing in. So, you know, you guys have a, um, you know, a fairly, um, you know, good look at the market and, you know, where would you say FinTech is today? You know, there's, there's, you know, in the news we see every week and especially the last six months, lots of layoffs, um, you know, the bank partnership, um, you know, that model has now come under further scrutiny from, uh, you know, from regulators. Um, you know, it feels like fintech's in this bit of a precarious position. FTX had the blow up, and it feels like the government's now just taking the shovel to anything crypto related with some of their recent moves. Um, you know, is fintech in a in a good place today? What would you say in terms of where you guys sit and kind of the companies you talk to and and uh, you know the founders that you're close with? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a great question, Todd, and it's one that you know we get asked a lot and we think about a lot. And I think some of the terms will you, people will use more directly is you know is fintech dead, and, and we we say like absolutely not. Like we couldn't yeah. disagree more with that statement. And here's why: is in any market correction, typically those that we've seen in the dot com uh, bust or the the great recession that we saw in two thousand eight to two thousand ten tech stocks in general are gonna come back down to earth because people are now more focused on uh, some of the core fundamentals of businesses. So revenue drivers, profitability. Now, FinTech as a whole, when you look at that compared to other just tech stocks, so as, as you look at like the NASDAQ composite, was already at a premium to everything else. So what we're seeing right now in public markets and the impact that that's having on the private markets isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's a great thing because what it means is that people are, are kind of resettling everything and almost taking what I like to call like the etch-a-sketch and shaking it out back on the fundamentals of business and business drivers. Now, here's why fintech is at the forefront of being able to work through these types of market recessions. One, fintech companies are closest to the money. So we, we talk about go-to-market strategy. The other GTM is get to get to money. Fintech companies are inherently closest to the revenue drivers, payments, transactions, processes, different ways that you can build some of these sustainable business models off of revenue and profitability. Two, as far as FinTech goes, do I think we're gonna see another, you know, like Chime or Robinhood? Probably not, but every business on the sun inherently needs to drive some sort of monetization strategy or revenue. And it's gonna be those FinTech businesses or embedded FinTech businesses that are gonna help them do that and, and do that at scale. Now, listen, there have been some bad actors as it relates to FTX and, and what you had mentioned, um, but ultimately, the reason why that failed wasn't the underlying technology. It was because there was some lack of human intervention in the middle. Like it was truly like human error that that drove that. And it wasn't what was happening behind the scenes. And so our perspective is this is now is the best time than ever before to invest in and to be building in core fintech products because the market is is a little bit more sleepy. There's less hype. There's less competition. And if founders in our network are able to really bunker down, extend out their run rates and build through this, they're going to find themselves in a phenomenal position to accelerate out of this broader market correction, similar to how some of the greatest companies of the last decade did through 2009, 2010, and 2011. And so, so it's a long-winded answer for a simple question, but no, FinTech is, is, is not dead. In fact, we think now is the best time to, to participate in the ecosystem. If I was a um, an early stage founder and and either I picked up this episode or or as an early stage founder myself, what what advice would you give them if they were about to raise money? Um, you know, would you tell them you know focus on you know certain amount of metrics, focus on you know your your path to profitability? Um, you know, kind of what would that advice look like today? Yeah, absolutely. I I think you nailed it on on the head right there. It's one is think about path to profitability and, and how you're thinking about driving revenue a hundred percent. Like it's important that you're not only building out an ecosystem, but growth at all costs is, has certainly been shifted over to profitability and revenue driving. Now, you don't want to cannibalize the market that you're building by doing that, but certainly you need to show that you have a fundamental understanding of those revenue drivers, especially as you get closer to that growth stage. So as you're getting to a series A, and certainly a series B, which historically and today is always the most difficult round to raise. 
you want to be mindful of those metrics. Now, on top of that, we're also looking for teams that know how to be scrappy, right? So if if we get a, a, a deck and there's this incredible team that, that has been built up around it, but they're raising a seed, the first thing you think is like, wow, that's a lot of overhead to, to have in a company at, at this particular stage. So you want to show that you know how to build in a team, uh, in a small team. Um, I think it, it was from the Right Foot episode where, where I think the term was a two pizza party moment. You want to see people have these small but mighty teams to iterate quickly when they find that, that initial sign of product market fit. And the other thing I'd recommend is being really mindful of the metrics that you want to raise at. So even if you have the opportunity to raise higher, the goal isn't just to bring in capital, it's to surround yourself with the best people at the table who can help get you to that next goal. So really being mindful about the smart capital you have at the table and thinking one or two rounds ahead. So not just the metrics you have for this round, does that lead you to sustainable growth of what you want to get to on that next round and inevitably to that next round? So it's no longer, I'm going to raise it the highest valuation possible so I can take on more capital and less dilution. It's thinking about people around uh, around my table with me and, and making sure that you're setting realistic expectations for yourself into that following round. Do you think, you know, the, say the last decade plus, you know, the proliferation of, you know, some of the uh, accelerators out there, you know, even the tech crunches of the world, even us, that um you know have kind of glorified in a way you know the uh capital raising process that more teams today say oh i need to raise capital from vcs versus maybe you know you reference the right foot episode or other founders that say hey let's be scrappy let's figure some things out and then when we need to raise or we need that rocket boost we go raise capital it feels like companies in some ways think they have to raise money from outside investors when the reality is they don't necessarily always need to do that right away. That's right. And especially in today's market, right? So maybe two years ago when your competitors can go out there and raise capital quicker to beat you to market, maybe you think your strategy, but in today's market where runway is the most important thing and you have time to build and really build those sustainable metrics. You don't need to. And there are a lot of alternative to venture capital that can provide that influx for you to be able to, to sustain and, and get through those particular parameters or milestones that you've set for yourself. Now, here's 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 um, something that, that we start to see a lot, too, at least as it relates to raising capital is the founders need to realize that the fundraising process, it, it'll certainly boom and lull, but it's not something that you do and then you do it again in six months. It is constant. And the best time to fundraise is right after you've announced your last round. And so founders who want to take on venture capital need to realize, one, certainly it's a more difficult market than ever before, but it's something that investors want to be along for the ride. Like you, you, it's okay to be vulnerable and to call out where your weaknesses are. And people want to be able to see how you tackle and how you approach problems over a long time. So the founders that typically have the most difficult time doing so are the ones who wait until their hands are out ready to take in capital. Um, to start having those discussions. The, the the best ones are the ones that bring you along for the ride uh, and, and re-engage with people, even if they passed on, on previous rounds. Um, so again, longer answer for a simple question, but um, no, you don't have to. But if you choose to go down that path, just know that's going to be a permanent part of your job moving forward. You know, we've referenced crypto a little bit uh, thus far. Uh, you mentioned your time at at Ripple. I also, you know, you, you put out an interesting blog post in September on on the Fiat website. Um, so I guess quick, you know, question, but then obviously longer, um, you know, to that as well is a: Are you still a believer uh, in blockchain uh, based applications for financial services? And b um, you know, where is where do you think that market is today? I mean, it's obviously been hammered uh, the last six months, but it's also been hammered in many ways because of dumb or um, criminal people decisions and not necessarily technology decisions. Yet, I don't know if regulators and, and legislators know that that full nuance uh, as we sit here today. Yeah, um, great question, great topic. Short answers, absolutely. I'm as optimistic about the underlying technology and applications than I ever have before. And the reason why is like, this is now the third crypto boom and lull and then winter that, <laughs> that I've been able to see firsthand. And 
and all of them as it booms everyone's like i, I told you so like i i i knew this was going to be the future uh and and this is i'm i'm going to put as much money as i can into it and that's always a dangerous time to be you know investing is when everyone else is saying the same thing and then the lull hits uh, and everyone says, I told you this is a scam. This is going to zero. I should have listened to, you know, the likes of the Jamie Diamonds of the world. Uh, and, 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 and then you hit the winter. And I think people mistake, like the winter isn't when the price goes down. It's when there's inactivity in the market for a sustained uh, period of time, which is typically like two to three years in crypto, sometimes even shorter. But it's in that time. And that's the time that I think we're in right now or are getting close to as the market kind of resettles on crypto when the best companies are founded like in the last crypto winter that's really where we saw DeFi take off with mm -hmm. the companies that were building around the nft space that saw a lot of initial adoption um and and that's that's where you see a lot of uh, foundations the one prior to that that's where a lot of exchanges and global exchanges were able to build their infrastructure blockchain analytics firms like chainalysis and and elliptic came out of that one and and before that that those were you know, the next web uh, or the crypto 2.0 projects like the Ethereum's or Ripple's or Stellar's or, or, or uh, you know, you, you polka dots of the world came out of that one. So short answer is no. But what I can tell you is I don't know what's going to be the breakthrough on the next one. All I know is that there's going to be some sort of advancements, whether it's related to broadband technology, whether it's related to quantum community, computing or the emergence of a metaverse type environment that actually is viable for adoption or something else that we can't foresee. But digital assets fundamentally. That that I'll leave you with as it relates to this broader topic is I think people they they far estimate how quickly it takes. Like people see this vision of where we can be with digital assets and they expect for us to be there in six months or in one year. And it takes time to build out the fundamentals here, but they underestimate the total impact that it's going to have on our world. This is the same thing as think about the adoption of internet or the adoption of 3G or the adoption of social media networks. We we are impatient inherently to, to <laughs> want to get to that utopian state that we foresee, but the overall impacts tend to have a much huge uh, uh, I guess impact on our lives than we ever uh, previously think. So. That's how I feel about crypto. I could take up a whole podcast talking <laughs> about it, but but yeah, I, I'm I'm still very much optimistic, and I'm I'm excited to see what gets built um, in the next wave. Uh, on that last point that you made related to you know the people think the world's going to change in six months. Do you think some in the crypto industry and and the biggest cheerleaders at times did themselves and the industry a disservice by talking about how quickly? this might happen it it feels like there was more overindulgence in oh this is gonna you know eliminate banking or this is gonna change how we deal with money in the next two or three years when in reality like you mentioned the internet and others everything takes a generation i mean it's it's never overnight and i i feel like they in part they they did themselves a disservice and then obviously some of the biggest names blew up but um you know i think there was some you know, overthinking on that side as well. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you're wrong, right? A lot of those founders and teams, they see the vision of what can happen and they want to share that vision with others to get them excited. Now, some of that is with the best intentions in mind. And unfortunately, some of that is malicious. Like, especially we saw like the ICO boom of 2017 into 18 of people who are just trying to sell a vision to make a quick buck and then ultimately just run off with cash. But there are others who, who truly see how this can fundamentally change a lot of broken systems. And, and, you know, here in the U.S., we are very fortunate to have access to the U.S. dollar into a banking system that is certainly flawed, but but has has a lot of trust in there. Like if I put my money in a Wells Fargo or Chase or B of A account, I know it's going to be there tomorrow. Yeah. Um, in other countries, unfortunately, you're not as lucky. And I think that's where they turn to things like cryptocurrency to be able to see a little bit more stability. Now, and you kind of mentioned this, right, is like, at the end of the day, human beings are flawed, like we're flawed <laughs> in, in some ways that we intend and some we don't. Uh, and unfortunately, that's led to some of the biggest explosions in the crypto space since the Mt. Gox era. Yeah. Um, and, and unfortunately, it'll probably continue over time. And so that's why it's important that regulators can see this happen and, and can hopefully step in a little bit more without stifling innovation. And that's always that tough balance of wanting to provide protection to consumers without 
creating so many protections where you can't grow organically and therefore you're giving maybe some of your biggest global competitors an edge on on these these new and uh, emerging technologies so again that's a whole different podcast in itself but um <laughs> well yeah, i mean also it's, it's you know, part selling a vision and yeah the regulators you know to be frank bernie madoff wasn't in crypto i mean he was in traditional finance so bad actors can proliferate no matter what the the industry is um and i think it's incumbent upon both the crypto and regulated and regulators uh to ensure that they work together to both understand one another and i think sometimes there's been a bit of a standoffish uh between the two but hopefully that that um you know starts to change uh during this winter um you know i i wanted to shift a little bit you know you've You've obviously been on both the operating and the investing side uh, of the table uh, in fintech. Um, you know, fintech has talked about this promise of kind of delivering financial services uh, in a fairer, uh, in a lower cost way. Um, you know, how would you characterize where fintech is today on that vision? Um, and, you know, what more? Uh, can the industry do to kind of get to that that state? Because uh, to me, it feels like the tools have been created, but they haven't been leveraged by the the population that probably needs it the most. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's it, it's important to call out that, and I mentioned before, financial technology truly is the greatest tool in enabling financial mobility and financial access. I've I've talked with other, spoken with others about this, but it's more than just like an education piece, right? Going to a class or providing educational tools. It's actually providing those products and services and putting them in the hands of the consumers that need them both or need them most so that they have time to be able to learn from that. And it's it's not like a cool, I did this online course or I invested in this app. It's truly like a generational to generational type of change that needs to take place. Now, the first wave of FinTech like a lot of financial institutions was focused on the highest margin type of consumer, which in the United States is predominantly one, one type of demographic. So the top 10 of the US. I know when I was at SoFi, that's what we were focused on is, is Henry's is what we call them, high earners, not rich yet. Mm -hmm. And that, was no, that wasn't because of any particular reason. It's just because that's where the, the highest margins are. But I feel very passionately, as do my co-founders, Alex and Drew, that there's a huge demographic that has largely been missed. And, and so that's who we focus a lot of our time on over the last several years in, in working with teams and founders who want to back those types of problems. Now, here's, here's the reality, unfortunately, uh, of, of where we are today, is that the large amount of our allocators, so investors in venture capital funds, a large amount of that allocation goes towards a particular type of, of investor, like largely white Caucasian males. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's not like if you're a, a, a white male that you like lead business school and you're handed a big check, it's it's still very difficult to do what, what we all do. But that in turn trickles down to the founders who are then backed and therefore the communities that they serve. And, and so what we like to talk about isn't necessarily that we're an impact fund or that you know we have a particular diversity mandate. It's that because we grew up in these environments that are representative of the cultures and, and the underrepresented populations in the U.S., we are looking at problems differently because we come from that. And that's ultimately how you're going to solve this in the long run is allocators who are providing capital to folks like ourselves, you know, Alex growing up in Stockton, Drew growing up in Oakland, we're then backing founders. So 44% of the founders we've backed are from underrepresented backgrounds, not because we said that we would go out and do that to a particular margin, but because they then see the the world in a very different place and then build out solutions for that demographic. And at the end of the day, that's going to build way more solutions to people who who need those products and services at at scale. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of pause there because I know that's a big, bold statement, but that's kind of how we see, see it is let's back the founders who have an inherent understanding of these problems, not because it's the right thing to do, but you can also create some, some pretty remarkable businesses from that. Do you think the the bigger change to get more diversity and to pick up on this point a little bit is that, you know, the LPs ultimately need to change a little bit in how they either allocate or, or put conditions on their allocation and say, Hey, if we're going to, if a pension fund or an endowment or something is going to give money to a VC, then, Hey, we need to see you guys put this type of money to work and for 
you know, these types of companies or these types of founders, because uh, ultimately, if, you, if it's not coming from the higher ups in how you're raising capital as a fund, then very little is going to trickle down, as, as you mentioned. That's right. Yeah. You, you know, what I feel like the problem is today, and, and it's getting better, and I'll, I'll call out there are some incredible LPs and, and other fund managers who are solving this. But what's happened to today is this, is like a lot of the social issues that we had 2019 through 2021 spurred people to want to set aside pools of capital towards impact funds or like diverse managers, which is really, really helpful in, in starting to just get people off the ground. But still, the vast majority of capital is going towards traditional venture capital funds that aren't very well represented across the board, whether that's a demographic or gender affected uh, uh, there. And so what, where we're really going to see the change is when those larger allocations and portions start to go into funds and firms who look at the world a little bit differently. And again, it's not it's not that you know we're out there saying like here here's a founder who's underrepresented serving an underrepresented community we will therefore give you a check we're looking at founders who have an understanding of a large swath of the market who has largely been unknown to date and we're finally to a point where it has been digitified uh, digitized enough so that you can provide fintech solutions for it yeah. and that in turn will will produce returns and so i think over the next you know three four five six years as firms like ours are able to prove that doing good and performing well aren't mutually exclusive from each other, you'll start to see these larger pools pour into it. But right now, and, uh, and uh, you know, unfortunately, Todd, like sometimes people are like, great, like it's great to meet you, Marcos. Tell me about your diversity mandate. <laughs> and I'll tell them, we don't have one. We just invest in these incredible founders who see the world different. They're like, oh, sorry, we have an impact fund, but we need, we need a diversity mandate. And I'll say, well, like, look at our returns. Look at the founders we back. Look at these incredible companies. Um, and 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 so it's there's a little bit of a, a, a friction point there, but again, it's it's getting better uh, almost every day. Which uh, which side of the table do you prefer to sit on, the operating or the investing side of the table? Yeah, um, it's easier to sit on the investing side. It's not easy, but it is easier. Um, the operating side, and, and listen, because we're consultants and we advise our companies, I'm very, it's very fortunate to be able to sit on both sides. Um, but I'll tell you, I think sometimes people f misunderstand the relationship between operator and investor. Um, as an investor, we are the roadies. We are setting up the stage for you. Um, but ultimately, the entrepreneurs and the operators are the rock stars. They're the ones pouring their heart and soul into these ideas and these companies uh, to bring them to life. And having been an operator, in many capacities, you get to see that full time where an investor comes in with a fun idea. On on and, that and point, you do you think do you think we've celebrated the big VC outperformer too much, where it it gives this classification that they're not, as you said, they're not the roadie, and that the VC is really the driver? Um, when in, re in reality, the operating company is still the you know is is who's serving the consumer, serving the small business. But have we glorified the investor too much? I, I think so. In, in, in today's market, the pendulum has swung back over to the side of the investor where I think some people are, are thinking like, I am, I am greater than. And, and we are huge proponents because we have been operators. Uh, that's not the case. Like, I'm not the first person to start a venture capital fund. In fact, I have a fund admin who does this for a bunch of people a lawyer who does this for a bunch of people and the structures are there doesn't mean that it's easy, but yeah. certainly it's not the same as, as being those founders. So we, we bring a lot of empathy in that case because we're operators previously. And we have this large consultancy that sees these trends. We can provide valuable feedback, not just based on a whim or VC Twitter, but what we're seeing with actual companies in the market today. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Like we, we know where our place is in this ecosystem. It's to certainly like look at the best companies, but once we make an investment, it's more than just a check. It's our time. We are in the trenches with them, making sure that they they can see success, and and we know where our place is at the end of the day. We can provide strong recommendations, but it's those founders and teams and operators who ultimately need to make those decisions for themselves. Now there can be some edge cases to that, um, and there's a that's a, another another podcast but yeah like it's it's truly it should be the founders are, are truly the drivers of innovation we we get to participate in it and i think that's one of the coolest 
things you can do and why I feel great to, to have the job that I do to be so close to it. Uh, best piece of advice you received from either a fellow investor or uh, a founder? Yeah, um, this was actually right when I was thinking about joining Fiat and, and getting into VC. I had always thought, Todd, that I was going to be an operator for 15, 20 years and then go and join VC. So when this opportunity presented itself, I remember talking to a mentor of mine saying, like, this, this is this is coming up. This is what I want to do. But it, do you think this is too early? And they said, Marcos, one is is it's tough to break into this industry. So you never know when that's going to happen. And if you want to be in venture capital, be in venture capital. Just go do that. So the piece of advice was this is sometimes I think all of us try to plan out our lives. If I want to do this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this to, e to equal this. If you know you want to go into a particular place, if you know you want to found a company at some point or be in venture capital, just go do it because you might end up getting there and realize that that maybe that wasn't where you want to be in the first place. Now, yeah. I feel fortunate this is exactly where I want to be, but that that was probably the best piece of advice I received in, in the last several years. Just just go do it. Uh, do you have a uh, an investment regret that you can share? Um. I was told we love our children equally. Um, I've, I've got two kids, so so I, I actually do love them equally. Uh, so if they ever listen to this, as, I as do I. So I have I have two kids, and yes, I love them equally. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes, yes, we got that on the record. Now. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, you know, I, I won't say anything specifically, but you know, we we just closed up fund one. We're still deploying out of it, like. I've been an angel for about a decade. I've done, you know, over two dozen deals on the corp dev and BD side. It's very different once you're on the venture capital side, when you think about portfolio construction and reserves and all of these things. So, so yeah, like I, I think we learned some early lessons in it, you know, maybe participating in some companies that were later stage than we should have at the time, or how do you think about a pre-seed versus a, a seed type opportunity? And where's that sweet spot for you? Um, we've made some phenomenal investments, but there's not a single co-investment or investment that we do where we don't learn something new. And we really try to like take away as much from that as possible. So um, that's one. And I also bought a couple crappy NFTs <laughs> in the last <laughs> hype. So that's, I'm sure my wife will tell who, you. Like, who yeah, hasn't that done that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She'll probably, if you ask her, she'll tell you, yeah, yeah there's a couple NFTs you probably shouldn't have bought. Yeah. Uh, we have just a, a few minutes left. So I'd like to end uh, a little bit lighter. Um, do you have a favorite book or the last book that you read? Yeah, maybe a little bit of both. Um, last book I read, I'm, I'm just finishing this up. Um, it's a biography on Bob Iger, who's the CEO of Disney. And next one I've got up is, is Shoe Dog, which is um, Phil Knight's from Nike. I love to read about other people in different industries and their concepts on leadership and how they pick themselves up. Listening to podcasts like this. Um, it really helps you understand that it humanizes the the what it takes to get to those levels of success and what you want to build. Because I think we see brands and we think like, oh, that's always been there. But I love learning about those those little lessons along the way because you learn so much from others. So so those are the ones that, that I'm, I'm I'm reading right now and spending time in. The one that I have next to my desk is um, Secrets of Sand Hill Road. Uh, Scott Cooper, who's the managing partner in Drews and Horwitz. Phenomenal read. You can read it front to back. I've got a ton of notes in there. Anytime I have a question about like anything from a term sheet to investment docs, he breaks it down still wonderfully. So if you're in venture capital or want to, that's always the book that I send to people because it's it's such a, a great read. And then the last one I'll leave with you is uh, How to Make Friends and Influence People. Um, uh, Dale Carnegie, the title sounds manipulative, but really the, the concepts are putting other people's cares and thoughts in front of your own to build deep meaningful relationships i read that every uh every, every three years and um yeah Bra brown bear brown bear what do you see as a popular one now with son and i um <laughs> so that that's probably the one i'm reading the most Be between that and the mixed up chameleon for kids books i probably <laughs> read those about five times a night so <laughs> uh yeah you know, what do you do to to unwind clear your head yeah um I get as far away from screens as possible of, of any sort. So <laughs> my favorite things, um, I've got a little attached. So I'll take my, my son with me on a mountain bike ride. Uh, my daughter's she, she's, she's almost four months. So she's too young for this, but she will go actually. And, and our dog out, and we'll go on like a little ride around the lake where you can live by or 
uh, go on hikes, um, really anything outdoors where you're far away from people and screens. And I just think my clearest once, you know, you're, you're just kind of out there. So Saturday morning, family try to give my wife the day off or that time off. And it's just full dad immersion mode. And I, I know you, you, you probably see this too, Todd, because you said you've got a couple kids. Like, nothing is better than you can have the best day or the worst day in the world. They don't care. They just want you to read a book or, yep. or hang out. And so that, that's, that's, that's been the greatest thing for me. Uh, do you have a favorite sport or sport teams that you root for? Yeah, um, I like outdoor sports. So skiing, mountain biking, uh, those types of things I, I watch a lot. Like Red Bull TV is on a lot on the background for me, and, and I try to get my trying to get my kids in, into a lot of that. My favorite sports, however, uh, has been the Oakland Raiders for a very long time, which is a very difficult sports team to be a fan of. So I always <laughs> tell people I may not know sports teams, but you know I'm going to be loyal because if I'm still proudly rooting for the Oakland Raiders, uh, then 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 you can bet that I, at least now, I'm now not the Vegas a, Raiders a bandwagon. <laughs> That's right. That, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I got to go see a first game this year and um, yeah, it's better than O.co, but it's still sad to see it uh, out of the day. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite vacation spot? Yeah. yeah um, I'm sure my wife will shake her head at me for saying this. There, there's a wonderful place called Cayuco. It's just north of San Luis Obispo in the central coast of California. It's, it's called like the last great beach town. And um, it's been our go-to over the summer. It's not fancy. It's not like far. It's not destination. But we get a beach house. And I try to the best of my ability, go offline for a week. And um, now that we've got kids, like we went through the last couple, but especially last year as my son was, it's like the greatest family time ever, you know, burying each other in sand and hanging out. That's yep. that's become our happy place. Be before that is Kirkwood uh, in California, which is a ski resort, which is like, my happy place, but I, I cannot break away um, from the family uh, <laughs> at least at this stage until they start skiing a little bit more. Um, but yeah, those, those are kind of like the, the happy places. And then final question, um, you know, biggest inspiration, what, what inspires you? Yeah. Um, my dad, my, certainly all of my parents and my family, but my dad, my, my dad grew up in Mexico until the second grade. And he was that dude who was, you know, working on farms, got himself an educate uh, an education and made a really successful career for himself as financial services. And I think about him, I think about my grandpa, his father, who had to drop out of school in the second grade to raise his kid, his, his, his brothers and sisters, um, you know, what really inspires me is you know, less than 2% of partners in venture capital are Hispanic. And my, I have a very successful family from having immigrated from, from Mexico to the U.S., but like no one in my community grew up in and no one in my family has the opportunities that we do today to be at the forefront of venture capital and these incredible emerging technologies with these founders that I, like I mentioned, they're rock stars. They're some of the smartest, brightest, talented people I've, I've ever met in my life. And so that's what inspires me. It's, it's my dad. Like if I'm having a tough day and it's like 10 PM, but I, I have a couple more hours of work, I dig deep. And that's what I think about is just how lucky I am to be in this position. And so it's not easy. There's a lot of 15, 16, 17 hour days, but yep. that's what inspires me to move forward is just knowing how lucky I am to even be in this seat. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say my dad. Well, Marcos, I appreciate you coming on the show and giving me a few minutes today. If someone wanted to reach out to you, wanted to reach out to Fiat, how, how can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. We, we um, welcome any inbound. Um, you can do that at hello at fiat.vc. Um, we, we do a lot of inbound that way or send me a note either via LinkedIn or email marcos at fiat.vc. We'll always welcome to any. Um, appreciate how you have me on the show, Todd, and looking forward to to keep in touch and, and continuing to listen to some of the great folks that you have on there. I appreciate the chance to be, to be one of the few, maybe not the top 50%, but at least on here. Oh, well, I appreciate, I appreciate the kind words and, and thank you for your time. You know, continued success to you uh, and the rest of the fund. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll get you back sometime in the future. Absolutely. I'd, I'd welcome that. Thank you. Thank you.